Good morning. It is the 23rd of August at 11.30 in the morning, and I'm coming to you today with your first video lecture, and this is going to be a pretty short one. And the topic of this one is prehistory. This is what goes along with lecture one and lesson one. And let's start first with our earliest ancestors. Uh, much of our early history is speculative, and it comes from a combination of different sources. We got historical sources, We've got anthropological sources, which is the study of humans and culture, and then biological discoveries and biological uh, studies. And I know sometimes this can be different depending on personal views, but what I'm looking at here is just kind of like the conglomerate, the standardized um, academic view. Um, our earliest ancestors are going to appear in the savannas, the, gray, the grasslands of eastern Africa and southern Africa, somewhere around four million years ago. That's where we have been able to date the earliest hominid fossils or uh, earliest hominid uh, beings that could be classified as humanoid. We know that these ancestors of ours are going to stay in the grasslands and the savannas of Africa for a little while, uh, about one and a half million years ago or so um, is when that changes. Prior to that, from one and a half million years ago to four million years ago, uh, these early hominids, they're very limited in where they can move because of climate. Uh, they can't go where it's too hot. They can't go where it's too cold. But the development of fire, meaning when humans or human-like people or hominids, if whatever you want to call them, are able to control fire, that's when they're able to go on the move for the first time. Homo sapiens are our direct ancestors. In fact, today we as modern day humans are known as Homo sapiens sapiens. These early Homo sapiens are our direct ancestors. They appeared about 100,000 years ago and they lived up till about 40,000 years ago. And the period where the Homo sapiens lived, that's known as the Paleolithic era. Uh, make sure you do know that. That is going to be a word on the midterm I can tell you right now. Paleo means old. Uh, lithic means stone. Uh, if you've ever heard of the paleo diet, uh, the paleo diet, that's just the old diet. So paleo is old. Lithic is stone. The old stone age, the paleolithic age. The people who are living in the Old Stone Age or the Paleolithic Age, they are what are known as hunter-gatherers. They're going to live in groups of about 20 to 50 people. They're going to have to catch or hunt or pick everything that they eat. Uh, there's no supermarkets. There's not even any farms or gardens at this point in time. Uh, everybody has a job. The men are going to hunt animals. The men are going to provide the large meats. The women are going to gather roots and berries and seeds and fruits and all of those things. A very important part of this hunter-gatherer lifestyle is the term kinship. Uh, kinship is going to be the family group, if you will. Um, they're going to be people who are related or live together, and everybody in a kinship group is going to contribute, and everybody knows what their role is. They're going to share knowledge of society, uh, social norms, a uh, form of law. They're going to share uh, knowledge of plants and animals. And that's where our traditions and our rules and our beliefs are really going to be um, stemming from and created from. Our closest non-homo sapien relative is the Neanderthal. And the Neanderthal, they lived from about 120,000 years ago up to uh, 35,000 years ago or so. And they lived in colder climates of Europe. Uh, we are constantly learning more about them. And it turns out that if you are of non-African descent, meaning European or Asian descent, it's very likely you have somewhere around 3 to 5% DNA in you that is made up of Neanderthals. And what that actually tells us is that Neanderthals, they lived with Homo sapiens, they had children with Homo sapiens, and they, they um, live on through us. Now, what separates Neanderthals from Homo sapiens? Well, they're skilled hunters, they used tools, they had burial rituals, they wore makeup, they wore clothes, 
they even honored the dead and, and uh, could speak. Maybe not like us, but they could speak. Uh, but what really set them apart is their body structure. They were larger and their bone structure was larger. And in anthropological terms, they're known as more robust. Basically, they could handle the cold climates better than Homo sapiens. And they could handle um, not getting bones broken or anything like that uh, much better. What happened to them? Our best guess is climate change. Um, that's what the working theory is now in anthropological circles. There's another relative I have at the bottom here called the Denisovans. Uh, we don't know much about the Denisovans. Uh, they've only been transcribed from a, a couple of sites, but it looks like they're kind of like a go-between between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. They have features of both um, groups of, of humanoids. This is a video that I would show in our our face-to-face -face class if we were having one. Um, if anybody's interested in this video, just send me an email and I'll give you the link. Um, now what happens after the hunting and gathering? Um, well, we start to get into agriculture and agriculture and the idea of the village are very closely related. Uh, you're going to start to get agriculture nine to ten thousand years ago and that the development of agriculture is going to mark the line between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. What does Neolithic mean? It means New Stone Age. Neo means new, lithic means stone. Why did we switch to agriculture? Well, there's a decline in the availability of food. Uh, humans are very good hunters and gatherers and there was just not enough wild food available anymore so the people living had to come up with another option and that was to try and domesticate and grow food. So they start to domesticate plants and they start to domesticate animals and that's going to start in the area that is today Iraq and Iran. Um, the first animals that are going to be domesticated are like sheep and goats and eventually pigs. And the first plants that are going to be grown are like wheat and barley. Uh, we have a change in technology. You probably don't think of Tupperware as being a technology, but once upon a time, clay pots, they were the newest technology. They were the iPhone of the day. Once these people were able to store food, it meant that they could grow surpluses and keep food. And if they can have a surplus, they could have a bigger population. And the age-old story, more people means more food, and more food means more people. It's just a cyclical thing that keeps going and going and going. By the time we get to around 6,000 BC or 6,000 BCE, depending on which naming idea you prefer, uh, Western Asia, which is today the Middle East, they've got full-blown animal domestication and full-blown agriculture going on. Um, and, but it does take a little while for this idea of growing your own food to expand around the globe. In fact, it doesn't come to the people of North America until about 1000 AD. All right, I mentioned village life. Uh, villages are going to be directly related to agriculture, and that's because suddenly we have to have a way to make pottery and weave supplies to uh, keep our surplus storage and then we're also going to have to develop the idea of tools to do the the farming with and weapons to protect our goods so we're going to get the invention of something known as an artisan what's an artisan a person who makes something uh, we're also going to get long distance trade uh, we have evidence of people in asia trading with people in china uh, and it makes sense. If I have a lot of chickens and somebody else has a lot of goats, why am I going to just grow goats and grow chickens when I can make a trade? I'll give you some of my chickens if you give me some of your goats. The other big development that comes from village life is the idea of war. Um, why should I give you any of my chickens when I can just take your goats by force? So trading, the rise of agriculture, and war are all very closely related, believe it or not. Our little villages are going to start to grow up, and by the time we get to 3500 BC or 3500 BCE, we start to get what you could classify as a city. 
A city is going to have farmers. A citizen is going to have artisans. But a citizen, a city is also going to have merchants, people to buy and sell things. And then a city is also going to have administrators, people who serve as warriors, as protection administrators to run everything and tell people what to do. And then priests who are going to control the uh, the religion. When you really look at it, these warriors and these administrators, they don't really add much to the city. They only take, but having administrators is vital to city life. Uh, one a great, great example is the idea of the priest. The priest was supposed to be the person who went between a higher power or their, whoever their god may be and the people. And because of that, it would be the priest who speaks with the gods and tells the people when to harvest and when to plant and where to direct the water and things like that. Um, and speaking of water, we start to get irrigation. And to have irrigation, it means we also have to have an understanding of science. Uh, the people of the Middle East, specifically an area known as the Fertile Crescent, which is between the Tigris River and the Euphrates River, uh, they figure out how to draw ditches in the sand and dig out these ditches in the sand and direct the water to the fields instead of just having a little strip of water where they can grow. They're going to water miles and miles of fields and really increase their food production. And last but not least, we start to get this idea of civilization. Um, once our cities are growing up and we have, you know, an established agriculture system and legal system and even an established um, religion, we start to get the idea of civilization. And our first true civilization is a place called Sumer, which would be in modern day Iraq and modern day um, Iran today and also part of Kuwait. Uh, basically, if you look at a map and if you look at where the Euphrates River, the Tigris River, and the Arabian Sea come together, that is going to be where Sumer was. Now, Sumer, it wasn't like a civilization led by one king. It was actually a bunch of different cities that lived a similar lifestyle. Each of these cities originally had different rulers and slightly different laws and different beliefs, but they all lived very much the same way, which is why we classify them into a civilization. And they traded with others. They would trade food and, and they would trade metal and stone and all these things with the people around them and people further away, such as in Egypt and in India and even in China. The Sumerians, we'll talk about them more next week, but they're the ones who developed the idea of math, and we still use some of their math today. They come up with the first writing system known as cuneiform, and they come up with really the first organized religion as well. And from there, we're going to start getting into written history and be well on our way to what we're going to discuss in this class. Now, as I promised, embarrassingly short, we're under 15 minutes. I cannot guarantee all lectures will be this short, but I will try and make them interesting enough to keep your attention. If there's anything I need to do for you, please let me know. And if there's anything I can do to improve these videos once you watch them, please let me know that as well. And I look forward to hearing from you. And I hope you have a great day. We'll talk to you soon.